So I go to the ER. I am vomiting blood at this point. I go into his office. He looks at the x-ray. He looks at me and he says, you need to get to the hospital right now. We're taking this band out. And I'm like, what? And he said, this band has slipped halfway through your stomach. Now, keep in mind, when they put the band around my stomach, they stitch it in. I had been purging so much for that 24-hour period. I broke the stitches and the band was slipping down my stomach. And one day I just had enough. It was like an epiphany just happened. And I was in constant pain. I was miserable. I was an absolutely miserable human being at that point. And I finally said, I'm done. Hey there, I wanted to let you know about my latest book, Body Confident, that's coming out in September 2024. Call it a critical thinking guide to your health journey because it is a framework, a guide, a blueprint that's going to help you understand and be able to filter all the information that's out there on the internet that you're getting from social media, YouTube, go to bodyconfidentbook.com, sign up for updates. The book comes out in September. What's going on, everybody? It's Coach Bronson here, and today I've got Michelle Hall, who's got a very unique and interesting story to talk about today. Uh, Michelle is, you're working as a coach in some kind of boot camp program or something right some now, right? kind of F2 method boot camp, yes, for the past yeah. year now. Wow, that's crazy. It's been, time just flies, you know? Right. Uh, so tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, I mean, you're like, you know, like we just mentioned, you're the primary coach right now in our boot camp. Um, and you've been working with me, has it been three years yet? Two. Two? A little right, over two? Years. Yeah. Okay. So tell us a little bit about, you know, kind of how you got to where you are now, and then we're going to get into the really fun stuff and your background and story and that kind of thing. So, I, you know, I, I had started my, my ketogenic journey back in 2020 and did really, really great the first year. And then literally year two, nothing happened. And then year three came and nothing happened. So I was like, okay, what's going on? I, I don't understand. And then I watched this guy at Keto Salt Lake City, and he had some really interesting things to say about women over 40 and fitness and building muscle. And I'm like, okay, maybe I'll try exercising finally. And that guy just happened to be Bronson Dant. And that was how my relationship with you began. And finally got nudged off of a two-year stall and am heading in the right direction again after, you know, just kind of sitting stagnant for a while and yeah. allowing my body to heal and do what it needed to do. But then also realizing, okay, I should still be progressing here. And I, something had to change. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. Because I believe that one of the points from that talk that I really wanted people to get was um, once you figure out the combination of the nutrition and fitness piece, then you can really never stall. Like you should never stall. Like there will be times where things slow down, but you're, you're going to realize there's so many other things that you're tracking that it's not just a weight thing. It's, it's, there's this component, that component, and this component, and there's pro progress is happening all over the place. You just got to stop looking at one thing. Yeah. And when I stopped just focusing on the scale and the weight that was on the scale and realized all the other things were happening. Yeah. It was, it was a huge shift for me. That's awesome. That's awesome. So you started doing a ketogenic diet in 2020. What was the impetus for that? So my dad passed away in October of 2019, and he was 67 years old and died from Lewy body dementia. And it was a horrific last five years of his life just to watch his decline, not only cognitively, but physically as well. And my dad was a type two diabetic. He had high cholesterol and was taking statin medications and was on all these various prescriptions for, I don't even know how many years, and then died at 67. And he was a very active, like that man never sat still. So for him to end up basically bedridden for the last few years of his life, it was a horrible thing to watch. Yeah. And so then I went through my, my pity party after I lost my dad and in 2020, we all know what happened or this time, 2020, 
And I sat at home and I ordered in food to help restaurants stay afloat. And I just ate all the things because we couldn't do anything. We couldn't go anywhere. And one day I just had enough. It was like an epiphany just happened. And I was in constant pain. I was miserable. I was an absolutely miserable human being at that point. And I finally said, I'm done. I can't live like this because if I get this thing that's going around, I'm probably going to die. And that mm. was, I think, the biggest wake up call for me was I am so unhealthy. I am in such bad shape. Any little thing can kill me at this point. And yep. that was it. Yeah. And that's unfortunate what did happen. The general health of the of the world today. Mm -hmm. uh, right. It, it, it the straw that broke the camel's back, so to speak. Yep. What, um, so, so you found, how did you find keto? So you went through that and you're like, okay, now what am I going to do? What, how, what changes am I going to make? What's the right thing to do? How do I find what, what's going to work for me? What was your process there? So this was actually the third time that I had attempted keto. Uh, the uh -oh. first, yeah, third time's a charm. Third time was a charm for me. Uh, the first two times it was, let's, you know, get all these recipes and all these fancy things and all the package stuff that said keto on it because, oh, then it's good for me. Right. So I would go in, I never made it past a month doing keto. Wow. Okay. And that was my husband and I doing it together. And one of us would say to the other, let's get pizza. Let's go get Mexican food. Let's do this. Okay. Twist my no, arm. No over. enablement there. Right. No, no enabling at all teeny tiny little bit. So it, it never kept going. And I, it's funny because I go through my Facebook memories of when I had attempted keto before and I'm like, Oh yeah, this is so hard. And then the next week I was, you know, eating half of a pizza and chicken wings. So obviously it was hard because I didn't have a reason to keep going and mm -hmm. actually complete the, the transformation that I needed to complete in order to make myself a healthier version. Yeah. Wow. So how did you find the thing? So you, you tried keto three times. What made the third time different? It's actually kind of a funny story. Um, I was working at home as we yep. all were at that time. And this notification for a live video on Facebook popped up and it was Dr. Ken Berry. Okay. And I don't think I followed Dr. Ken Berry at that time. So I'm not sure <laughs> how I got that notification on Facebook, Yeah. but I clicked on it. And it was a study that had been released regarding the, the reversal, essentially, of the fact that saturated fats cause heart disease and clog your arteries and so on and so forth. And that it was actually shifting more towards maybe it is carbohydrates that are doing this. And that was always a cop out for me was I'm going to eat all this fat. I'm going to plug up my arteries. I have all these cardiovascular issues in my, my family. I'm just setting myself up to have a, a heart attack or to die of a stroke. And hearing that and just everything kind of fell into place. Like this was the time for me to make the change. Everything okay. happened in a way the, the information started being released, debunking all of the studies from, you know, the 50s, 60s, 70s of the, the low fat era that I grew up in and okay, let's try it for real this time. So I sent yeah. my husband a text message because he was working in Washington state. And I said, I'm doing keto. You can do it if you want, but I'm not cooking different food for you. That means he's doing it too. And his response was, okay, you know, I like meat. Right. And, yeah. There you go. And that was it. Okay. So that, that's that, that we might talk about that. Cause I, I think you knowing you and your husband um, and just in the time that we've known each other, what that, how that's changed um, might be an interesting topic of discussion. So let's get back to that towards the end. Okay. Um, you have another aspect before keto, before all of this stuff happened, another aspect of your life. I think I definitely want to touch on because it's unique. Um, it's not something that a lot of people like to talk about. Uh, it's something that many people go through um, and we've experienced. There are people that go through it and they don't want people to know that it's something that they've gone through. There's uh, a mystique around it and that I'd like to, de you know, I'd like to, to say right out the gate, no, nothing that anyone has tried to improve their quality of life is shameful. 
You're trying to become a better person. There should be no shame. Making a mistake or feeling like you, you made the wrong choice or regretting something that you've done, that's life, guys. We've all got that. And we all learn from the mistakes that we make and we make better decisions down the road. At least hopefully we do. Right. So sometimes we have to go through some things that we regret. And I think your situation would fall and in, fall into that. Mm -hmm. um, but you learned a little bit. You learned a little bit going through this. Right. So go ahead and talk about your where you were years ago and, you know, how far you've come. But let's talk about the, the major, major event there. You know what I'm talking about. I do. So yeah, I'm definitely a, a student of hard knocks. I, I have got to learn the hard way and it's just how I've been my entire life. Um, so I, I've i always had, as, as far as back as I can remember, I've always had an issue with my weight. Um, mm -hmm. I was always heavier as a child. I was put on my first diet when I was nine, I believe, and yeah. have always struggled since. Um, I've always been the bigger girl in the family. I mean, you know, I am... I, a good five inches taller than my sister. I have a much bigger frame than she does. I am the polar opposite of her, but was consistently compared to her because she was little and she was thin and she was fit and I wasn't. So I had issues with my weight and with food from the time I was little. And it just carried on through my adult life. Um, I was pregnant with my son when I was 20. I gained 75 pounds during that pregnancy because I'm pregnant. I can eat whatever I want. <laughs> and then I had a baby and I'm like, oh, wait, this stuff didn't all go away either. Yeah. So, yeah, I've, I've always had issues with my weight. And so in 2011, I went to a seminar at a weight loss surgery clinic in Las Vegas where we lived at the time. And it was a procedure that I had always said I would never do. And then I found out that my health insurance would pay for it 100%. And I'm like, oh, okay, maybe I will. Because why not? Uh, yeah, why not yeah, okay. pay for it? Ultimately, I paid for it, <laughs> but in a completely different way. <laughs> yeah, in one way or another, right? Yes. Uh, so in May of 2011, I went through and had the lap band put into my stomach. Mm -hmm. And essentially what it is, is, you know, we've got the stomach area. They take about this much at the very top, at the end of your esophagus, the top of your stomach, and they wrap a silicone band around it. There was a port that was then also sewn into my abdominal muscles for them to be able to put fluid in and out of the band because there was a little uh, tube inside that would contract as... Tighten it or cool. loosen it up. Yeah. Correct. Gotcha. And so they would not pay for the gastric sleeve because it was too new at that point. Mm -hmm. And I knew I did not want to do um, Ruin Y, the, the bypass, because that right. was just a little too extreme. And I knew people who had had it done that were at the point they were five, six years down the road, and they were starting to have some pretty significant health issues. So I didn't want to go that route. So I'm like, okay, let's do this because it's not as invasive, except you know, introducing a foreign item or object into your body is just a little bit invasive. Yeah. So uh, had surgery done and it was really, really hard. You know, the, the prep for it wasn't as extensive as they made it sound like it was. You know, I met with a therapist for about 15 minutes. She cleared me, said I was going to have no issues with this. I was good to go. I had my medical clearances and literally within a six week period of time, it went from seminar to surgery date. It went very quickly. Wow. And there was no follow up after that, aside from doctor visits to weigh in and add fluid or remove, remove fluid from my band. And that's how it was. And there, and there was no prep on the psychological side of what the impact was going to be after you got it. None so it was... Fun purely a, do we think she can physically handle this? No awareness of how is this going to change your life? What to expect afterwards? None of that stuff. No. Wow. Okay. Nope. So. And then no support afterwards either. No, there was a support group, but they met, I think once a month at the doctor's office and I wasn't going to drive all the way to his office to sit in a group of people and, you know, talk about yeah. how much weight I was losing. That That's what I thought it was as mm -hmm. opposed to actual coaching in a sense yeah and, yeah and support in that manner. So the first year I did great. And my goal was to lose a hundred pounds in the first year. I think I hit 75 
which was short okay. of my, my hundred pound goal, because I had this number, this magic number in my head. I was 275 pounds when I had surgery the morning I went in and I got down to 200 or maybe 199. And I was super excited to be under that 200 pound mark. Yeah. And then the second year, it, you know, it slowed down. It was very gradual. And I don't think I ever got below 179 pounds. So I never actually lost a hundred pounds having wow, 94 pounds. Yeah, yeah. I was super disappointed and I was legit disappointed because I didn't have that magic 100 pound number that yeah. so many other people had. So then year three, things started to happen and life happens and things develop and you learn how to cheat the system. Mm. And just like I learned how to cheat Weight Watchers all those years ago, I absolutely learned how to cheat my band. So while I wasn't able to eat bread or consume large portions of meals, ooh, your girl could suck down a milkshake like nothing. <laughs> yeah, And that yep. would be my go-to. Like if my band was too tight and I couldn't get into the doctor, I would just go get a shake. And that mm. was my meal because, hey, it's not much. And it made me feel so much better about myself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so then, yeah, wow. we moved from Vegas to Arizona. And that was when the real problems started because no uh, bariatric surgeon in Arizona would see me because they had not done my band placement. So I had zero doctor's treatment for my band for 10 months after having moved. That is, is that common? That's very interesting. I've very never heard common. that before. Very common. And every doctor, if I had had the Rue and Y or if I had had the sleeve, they would have seen me. But because they did not place the band, they didn't want to touch me. That is fascinating. I've never heard that before. Okay. Yeah. And that's still an issue that can still happen to people today. If you get it someplace and then move. Yes. 100%. I did not hear that. Okay. So I, in May of 2015, this is four years, almost four years to the day that I had the band placed. Mm -hmm. I was at work. I was eating pistachios because, you know, they're nuts. They're healthy. And I got stuck. And what that means is the nuts got stuck in that stoma, that little pouch that I had, and they wouldn't go through. Well, mm. it was causing irritation, which was causing my stomach to swell and close up. So then when you have uh, bariatric surgery, you don't necessarily vomit, but you have what they call a productive burp, where it's okay. like a burp, but you're bringing everything that you had back up. Yeah. So that happened and it happened quite frequently. Like I was used to it Ugh. and Ugh. then I would drink water and I was okay. And until I wasn't because yeah. then I had to keep doing it and I had to keep doing it. And this started at 10 o'clock in the morning at work. Yeah. And so by five o'clock PM, I was off work. I was on my way. I had not been able to keep anything down since 10 o'clock that morning, including water. My mm. stomach had completely closed. So I decided I would take myself to the emergency room. Why not see what's going on? Have them take the fluid out of my band, not knowing if I even had fluid in my band at that point, because it had been over a year since I had been treated. Right. So I go to the ER. I am vomiting blood at this point and mm. I'm letting them know um, there might be an issue. Oh, no, no, you're fine. So finally, a doctor came in. They did an x-ray. They looked at my band. They were like, your band hasn't moved. You're fine. Let's get you in to see a bariatric surgeon tomorrow morning. Awesome. Now a bariatric surgeon has to see me. It only took a trip to the ER. So I, I have that night. I'm going through the same exact thing that entire night as I did the, the day before. I go into his office. He looks at the x-ray. He looks at me and he says, you need to get to the hospital right now. We're taking this band out. And I'm like, what? And he said, this band has slipped halfway through your stomach. Now, keep in mind, when they put the band around my stomach, they stitch it in. Right. And I had been purging so much for that 24-hour period. Wow. I broke the stitches and the band was slipping down my stomach. And I actually argued with him because my son was graduating from high school the next week. And I said, I don't have time for this. I can't have surgery yeah. right now. And he's like, well, you don't have a choice. So walk over to the hospital, which was in the same parking lot. Yep. Get in there, check in, and let your family know you're having surgery. And wow. I bawled. I bawled because the only thing I could think was, I'm going to get fat again. 
because I'm going to have nothing stopping me from eating whatever I want to eat. Isn't that crazy? That was the first thought that came. Not, that, not thinking that I could potentially die. I was going to get right. fat again. That was worse than dying. Wow. So wow. I get to the hospital and they rush me into surgery. Within 30 minutes, I was in the OR with this doctor. My husband had left work. He came up to the hospital. He sat in the waiting room. And that procedure was about an hour long. Now, the placement of my band took 15 minutes. That's it. The removal took an hour because I had torn so much and I had done so much damage in a 24 hour period. The yeah. doctor came out and told my husband, I am so glad she went to the emergency room when she did, because she was less than 24 hours from perforating her stomach. My stomach had already started tearing. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So I was, and that would have been dead kind of bad. I would have been dead. Kind of bad. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All and right, I had, so. That was a very real possibility of that happening. They, of course, you get the, the, the laundry list of things that could happen when you have surgery, yeah. Yeah. never thinking that's going to. And mm -hmm. that was the most serious thing that could have happened. And it did. Wow. Okay. So you get the band off, then what happens? I could eat and I could eat everything. And yeah. I wanted to eat everything. And what was the, what was the, the, if you can go back to the thought process and the idea in your head that you didn't, you weren't in, I'm just thinking, I'm trying to put some of these things together, right? There was something about your awareness of who you were and where you were at the time where you weren't empowered to be in control of your life. You needed the physical alteration to control you. Correct. And how did, how did that, how did, how did you break away from that? It took a long time. Yeah. And it took a lot in here. So it's, you know, I didn't realize my issues I had with food mm -hmm. essentially my entire life until I started this process again in 2020. And when I finally let go and dug a little bit deeper and looked into what was causing all these issues for me to sit there and need food to comfort me to binge eat until I was ready to throw up. I never did, but mm -hmm. I got to that point where I would just eat and eat and eat and eat until I didn't feel whatever it was that I was feeling. Mm. And that's what I did basically my entire life. And I had no idea until I actually looked at why am I doing this to myself? Yeah. What is it? And I spent a good year uh, just dealing with past trauma from my childhood that I didn't even realize was there. I was not cognizant of how it was affecting me and what it had driven me to become and yeah. the yeah. steps I took to not feel those things, which was eating. That connection is one of the hardest things. I know we both talk about it all the time to get people to connect that the emotions that you have tied to things in your past mm -hmm. have established your actions and the things that you do, how you see the world, how you perceive everything about your life. Um, that's where your habit loops come from. That's where the actions that you take and the triggers that you have all come from, all that stuff in the past. Mm -hmm. And the reason a lot of people have an issue with being consistent with the things that they know they need to do is because they haven't dealt with those things. Can you talk a little bit about the connection that you have? Like, like, how did you make the connection between, or how did becoming aware of these things help you improve your health, right? That's the connection people can't make. Mm -hmm. Well, what does my past and my emotional trauma from the past have to do with me losing 50 pounds? Right. Right, or have to do with me getting rid or reversing PCOS or Hashimoto's or Increase, increasing my physical fitness. Like what is going on in my head have anything to do with me being able to improve my quality of life? Yeah. So and it was, I believe it was after the PhD summit that Dr. Barry had done in, in 2020. And I am almost positive it was Dr. Sivas, his, his talk, which I, I'm not going to lie. I was a complete blubbering idiot after his presentation because he finally made me look 
inside yes. and look at why am I doing this? Why am I having these cravings? Why am I giving into these cravings? Why do I use food to numb everything else that's happening in my life? And when I actually did it, it was devastating at the time because yeah. it hurt to admit I had a problem and I had issues from, again, my childhood that led me to this position that I am in now, where I am now 286 pounds, fatter than I've ever been in my life, heavier, yep. you know, heavier than I'd ever been, the most unhealthy I had ever been in chronic pain and still continuing to do this to myself. And him having you look inside at when you have a craving, stop. What is happening with you right now? Mm -hmm. Why do you want this? What emotion are you feeling right now? Are you excited? Are you sad? Are you stressed? Are you anticipating something? Like all the above. It didn't matter. I wasn't a sad eater. I was an every emotion eater. When I got oh, excited, wow. I wanted to eat. When yeah. I was happy, I wanted to eat. Like that's everything, every emotion I had went right back to food. It's crazy yeah. how you say that. I had a client that told me recently, uh, we were doing a session and they said that they, they didn't want to be an emotional person. Something about their past and the way that emotions, they were brought up around how to handle emotions. She said, you know, I don't want to be, I don't ever want to be too happy and I don't ever want to be too sad. And she used food and other things to kind of just avoid any of the extreme emotions. She wanted to be right in the middle all the time. Um, it's fascinating. I want, I, it makes me wonder how many people out there are just avoiding emotions. Feeling the feelings. You've got to feel the feelings. Right. You've got to feel the feelings, right? Yes, you have to wow. go through all of the emotions. You have to go on that roller coaster ride. It's it's a necessity. Like yeah. if I yeah. hadn't done that, which it took me a good long time to deal with. And even after I started working with you initially and I did my very first challenge with you, mm -hmm. I was still dealing with it and going through it and feeling it. And then it was like this weight came off of me that had been heavy for 40 years. Wow. And I felt free. I let go of the issues that I had had. I dealt with them as I needed to deal with them. I felt all the feelings and oh, my poor husband, whew, God bless him. <laughs> he went along that roller coaster ride with me. And, yeah. but it was a necessity because I came up on the other side, almost a completely different person. I wasn't negative all the time. I wasn't feeling sorry for myself. I didn't put myself into a victim position. It, I, I was, it was a 180 for Michelle. That's awesome. That's awesome. And that's what happens mo most of the time when you, when you, when you start developing that self-awareness and, and, and trying to understand yourself, it's really about learning about yourself mm -hmm. and we don't, we don't often focus inward. Yeah. It's always the situation, the environment, or somebody else's fault. And being able to take the ownership of where you are and understand, like, I am where I am because of the things that I'm doing and the way that I think and the actions that I take. Yep. And that's it. And then uh, that that's a whole nother conversation we could probably talk about is taking ownership of your journey. Learning um, to respond as opposed to react was huge for me. Yeah. Yeah. Thinking about what you do before you do it. Mm -hmm. What is, what are some of the things? So, you know, we know there are a ton of people out there that have had bariatric surgery. Mm -hmm. We know that, I don't know what the numbers statistically are, but, you know, the recidivism of people who get bariatric surgery and then gain all the weight back is very high. Very high. The people that have issues, health issues with the surgery itself, I would hazard a guess is not low either. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of people that are dealing with this. And again, it's not something that a lot of people talk about. What are some of the things that you would recommend to people that have gone through this or are going through considering it, they've had it and they're recovering or they're move, trying to move on afterwards? What are some of the, the things that you would advice you would give to people that are in that situation? 
the the number one thing would be to understand why it is that you have the issues with food that you do because ultimately that's why that's mm -hmm. why you've gotten to be morbidly obese to have multiple comorbidities which ironically you know qualify you to undergo a major surgery to be able to essentially just lose weight right but it's only because you've got that physical limitation to be able to eat it's not because you are being cognizant at the time that you are eating or are going through some emotional you know reaction or response and you you need to stuff your face um so the key is finding out why mm -hmm. why have i resorted to being like this and why do i need to get better why do i want to lose weight why do I want to, you know, get healthier? But I, I'm going to be completely honest. The the main focus when I was going through the the pre op and the seminars and everything, it, it was focused on weight loss. And right. then here and there, oh yeah, they were, you know, they they don't have to take their medication for type two diabetes anymore. It, that was sporadically thrown in, but the primary goal was weight loss. That's why it's weight loss surgery. It's not yep. to deal with all the other underlying issues that you have happening within your life, you know, in your body and in your mind. Yeah. None of that is covered. It just here's happens. A, here's, yes. Yeah. Here's a question. I'm thinking for somebody who's had the surgery, right? I just spent all this time, I spent all this money, had the surgery. It's six months later. Why do I even need to worry about that now? I've got the surgery. That's going to keep me on track. It's not. You are going to figure out the loopholes. You are going to learn how to cheat the system with regards mm -hmm. to your weight loss surgery. I did it. And almost everybody I know who's had weight loss surgery has done the same exact thing. I, in all seriousness, I think I know one person who is more than five years. Right. I had the, I had the surgery and I'm going to lose weight and that's all I need to worry about, except that's not it because you're going to learn to manipulate the system. You're going to learn how to cheat. You're going to learn how to get back to feeling the way that you need to feel because of what food does for you. Um, you're going to, you're going to figure it out just like I did with my milkshakes. I could, I could yeah. suck down a milkshake without issue. I never had to worry about a milkshake getting stuck in my band and it kept me happy because yeah, yay, yeah. endorphins I running just, through my body. Yeah. Something you said, like just here, the idea that it's not food's not the problem. It's not eating. That is your problem. You don't need to stop eating. I mean, you do need to stop eating, but it's the reason that you're eating. Correct. Right. So it's not that food, food isn't, like having an arbitrary physical limitation on food that you eat isn't going to stop you from feeling from avoiding the feelings that you have. And it's, when your, that... it's your avoidance of the feelings yeah. and trying to use food to avoid those and replace those feelings. That's the problem. And when that weight loss stops, yeah. like you've got something to focus on while you're losing. And for that first year, all I focused on I couldn't wait for weigh-in day. I couldn't wait to do my updated photos every month. I, I because that was my driving force was right. I'm going to see the differences. I'm going to see the lower number on the scale. That's what my motivation was. And when that stops, so outside of the outside of the psychological aspects of tr thinking that things are going to be better when you lose all the weight, what actually changed in your life? The amount of food I could eat. So did you, did you see any difference in overall health aspects, improved physical ability, any of the more energy idea in our head? Well, when I get to a certain weight, my life is going to be great. Everything is going to be perfect. Everything's going to yeah. be perfect. And then the, the idea that you have in your head for how the grand scheme of things is going to end up being nine times out of 10 doesn't happen. Um, I did not work out at all when i had yep. weight loss surgery i was I, I have no idea how much muscle i actually lost because my body was so much smaller but some of it was fat and a lot of it was muscle so yeah. i never even thought of you know healing myself i hadn't been 
diagnosed as a type two diabetic at that point. So I didn't have that comorbidity going for me, you know, when I was trying to get surgery done, I had to right. come up with other things. I wasn't, uh, you weren't sick enough, right? I wasn't, no. And so I would actually increase my blood pressure intentionally before I would go in to see the doctor so that I had high, hypertension. That's crazy. I had That's high blood crazy. pressure twice in a row and that labeled me as having hypertension because I would walk around the waiting room and yeah. I would hop up and down and I would get my heart rate going. So my heart rate was increased and my blood pressure was up. And how many people does that happen to when they just step foot inside of a doctor's office? Oh, for sure. Yeah. No. So That's crazy. I, I was able to manipulate the system in order to be able to get the surgery because I so badly wanted to be skinny. And that was yeah. all I cared about. I had no, no other health issues at that point in my life to worry about. As so where are, you, in the 40s. where are you now? So you've changed that mentality, right? You don't, do, do you no longer care about being skinny? I don't want to be skinny anymore. Like what are your, how does that change? I know I'm never going to be skinny. Like everybody that, wants that's, to be that's thinner. The thing. Yeah. You want to be thinner. I want to be fit. I want to be active. I want to be able to climb this freaking mountain that's right outside of my house that has <laughs> been stumping me for the past three years. I want to be able to accomplish big things like that. I want to be able to get on the floor and play with grandbabies. I want to be in the park and running around with them and doing things with them and not become uh, somebody who's stuck in a recliner or that is so frail that they can't do things without fearing falling over and breaking a hip. Like I yep. want to be the epitome of health at this point, thin, whatever, you know, I, I I'll look good in whatever I, you know, put on because I know how to style myself now, but it, <laughs> it's a completely different outlook now. And the health improvements that I have gotten over the past near almost four years is, yeah. is what is the biggest driving force for me. Now I don't compare my body to other people anymore because I can't, because that is completely unrealistic for me. You know, if I compared myself with coach Nat, I think I'm a foot taller than her. So I'm never right. going to look like Nat because it's just not realistic. I know the genetics that I've got. I know how my family uh, line looks and I fall right in, in line with that, except that I am not morbidly obese anymore. Like unfortunately, mm. a majority of them are. Mm. Wait, so your whole family has these issues that they're dealing with. So it must be genetic. That's absolutely ought to be genetic. Or we just all have the same issues <laughs> from the same <laughs> Right? Yeah. We got to come up with another phrase for it's not genetic. It's um, epigenetics. It, it is epigenetic. Yep. I mean, it, it really, it is epi epigenetic. That's not, that doesn't sound fun. Like something catchy. <laughs> we need a, a catchphrase. <laughs> come up with something catchy for, you know, it's your, we'll figure, we'll, I'll think of something. I always like coming up with stuff like that. <laughs> so, okay. So, Going forward for the rest of your life now, you have a different outlook. Um, you're helping people understand the importance of their motivations being the key thing to work through. Mm -hmm. What is the process that you work when you work with people? Because you've worked with other people who are dealing with this as well, who are dealing with going through the surgery and, and trying to figure out life after the fact. Right. Um, what, what are some of the challenges that, they, that you've helped other people through specifically here? Like, I want to talk specifically about people that have gone through bariatric surgery because we, again, we don't, we don't talk, I don't, I don't hear people talk about it a lot. Mm -hmm. um, I think you're in a unique place to talk about it and also to help other people who are going through it. So, you know, when you're working with somebody and, you, and they say, Hey, just so you know, I've had this, cause that's usually how it goes, right? They do their entire intake form. They may or may not put it on their intake form. And then you have that first conversation and they're like, Oh, by the way, I don't, I don't talk about it a lot, but this is also something that I've done. And I don't want people to know I had it done. And I don't want people to know, right? That's, so that's a huge how thing. do you help people just accept where they are, understand the impact of what, you know, the decision that they made, but that it's not the end of the world. There are things that they can do and it is possible to move forward from there. Yeah. So it, and a lot of it with regards to my coaching and my clients and people who have undergone bariatric surgery is we need to, it's 98% mindset because you've already gone through the process of having this procedure done. By the time they've gotten to me, they've lost a substantial amount of weight 
and they've stopped. Mm -hmm. And now they're like, okay, well, I can't have surgery again. So now what do I do? Okay. Well, there's a, that's a good, yeah, that's good. Okay. Yeah. I can't do it again. Okay. There are no more tools to help me tools to help me to lose weight. So now what do I do? Okay. Now it's time to start dealing with the crap that is in our lives. And that's the hardest part for them is because they are finally being forced to look within, to feel the uncomfortable feelings, to have to, you know, get that discomfort that they need for their growth to be able Mm -hmm. to continue on and move forward in a healthy way. Yeah. And then realize, okay, I can do this on my own. I never in a million years thought after I got that band taken out that I would be able to lose weight again, ever. So the fact that I've lost 65 pounds or more, I don't even know anymore, without a, without a, a device inside of me or having three quarters of my stomach cut out, oh, okay, yeah, this is a doable thing. This can't mm-hmm. happen. It's mm-hmm. not going to be the, the rapid weight loss and the rapid progress that you have when you have surgery, but that stops. And yeah. then what you and have, and you're also have. often not ready for it, right? right? When you have that such a drastic change, you know. I like I, I. This is a quote in my book, and we've talked about this before. It's you know, your life isn't a straight line. No, it's up and down because if it were a straight line, you'd get there faster than you're ready to handle. Like you can't, we we can't change things overnight. We have to grow into where we want to be. We have to stumble. We have yeah. to have those challenges. We have to, you know, and I, I tell my clients, like, ultimately, we want to grow. Growth is important. Growth is necessary. Mm-hmm. But growth is uncomfortable. And you have to feel that discomfort to move forward in a in yeah. a, a, a proper direction. Yeah. So that you don't fall back into what it was that got you here in the first place. Right. And then you wow. recognize those signs and you start to realize your triggers and you can stop them in that second instead of binge eating and then feeling like, what did I do? Oh my God, what did mm-hmm. I do? Why did I do that? I am so stupid. I'm going to starve myself all day tomorrow. I say yeah. it so easily because I've done it. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's, man, we could probably do a whole nother video just talking about guilt and mm-hmm. self self-flat- self-flatulation. Where can people find you, Michelle? I know obviously they can go to the website coachbronson.com and yep. look at, you know, the boot camp, which is your primary, the primary thing that you do, but you also do one on one stuff. I do. Um, you have an Instagram. What's your Instagram? It's keeping us keto, keeping underscore us underscore keto. Okay. That's where my um, husband oh, and I speaking of which, sorry, keeping us. I totally let's talk real quick about your husband. Let's talk about sure. good old Corey. In the last year, there's been some changes in his interaction and his willingness to participate in some of the things talk yeah. real quick about what your process was because this is a, a, one of the most frequent questions that we get from our clients because what 99 out of 100 of our clients are women over 40 mm-hmm. most of them are married um, and they've all got questions how do I get my husband to do this too it happens uh, it's it's a, one of the most frequent questions that we get yeah um, how did you get Corey to do. I'm sure you asked him about it every day. You wouldn't stop talking about it. Um, all those types of things, right? You, you, you just pounded him until you, you wore him down and you started doing stuff. <laughs> yes, because I can berate my husband like that. <laughs> so <laughs> no, actually in 2020, he, he went along this journey with me. He had no problem with it. Okay, fine. I'll eat the meat. I'll do this. I'll do that. And this man and his freaking weight loss was just insane. And he dropped 40 pounds in three months. And I was wow. furious. Oh, because I'm so think mad. I lost uh. <laughs> and he kind of just skated along after that, you know, didn't really try, didn't really, you know, just whatever. He stayed at the same weight until about the summer of 2022. Okay. And to um, August of 22, my father-in-law, his dad was diagnosed with cancer. Mm -hmm. And then the, all the things that happen when you find out a parent is going to die because he was terminal. 
start to mess with you and you don't want to feel those things and you don't want to deal with those things. And he went back to food and he loved to play off that he was still, I'm still doing keto. What are you talking about? I I, I'm doing great. Except that he had gained back all of his weight plus some. And I knew they had things at work that were definitely not keto friendly. Um, and he, he imbibed in those and he indulged and he, he fed his feelings instead of dealing with them. Um, Mm -hmm. April 30th of last year, my father-in-law passed and it was a very difficult time for my husband because it's difficult anytime you lose a parent. And I unfortunately had a preview of that and I tried to prepare him as well as I could for what's going to happen and how you're going to feel when you lose your dad. And it helped in some way it prepared him in some way, but, he just wasn't ready to feel all the stuff that he had to. Um, Towards the end of last year, he finally started to realize, okay, I need to change because I'm not doing well physically. I'm not doing well emotionally. And I handed him a sheet of paper that was the seven levels of why. And I'm like, Mm. Just start, I don't, just start doing I don't this. I think I knew this. I don't think you told me that. I didn't tell you this. <laughs> so I had him write a why. Do your mm-hmm. first why. And his first why was to lose his belly. Okay. Because he carries majority of his weight in his stomach. Yeah. And it just progressed from there over a few weeks. And my husband is down to his Air Force weight three months into the year now. He started again in January. And he started going to the gym with me. He started working out. He started lifting weights. This man has not worked out since he got out of the military in 2012 because he always viewed exercise as a punishment because it was, yep. you know, I wonder where he got that from. <laughs> yeah. So he, he's finally embracing that and he has a very physical job. I mean, he's an aircraft mechanic, so he is running around all day. He is lifting heavy things but it just wasn't enough. And now that Mm -hmm. he's working out and he is pushing himself and the night and day difference between what he was even three years ago and what he is today, he, the whole package is improving in him, but I could not force him to do it. Yeah. He had to to make that decision himself. That's awesome. And I think that's the the key takeaway, right? Uh, If the more you force force it, the less likely it is going to happen. Awesome. Cool. Well, thank you very much, Michelle. I appreciate it. I think a lot of people are going to get a lot out of this video and uh, we'll have to do another one sometime. So, I mean, I'm... it's not like we're not working together. We should do some things more often, right? <laughs> Take it All easy. Right. I appreciate it. Thanks, Bronson.